All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for waiting for the start of this uh, side event. Um, so you're here because uh, you want to listen to Foresight looking into emerging issues in food and feed safety. My name is Mar Marcus Lipp. I'm Senior Food Safety Officer in um, FAO. And I'm happy to chair this side event. And um, even more happy to introduce my colleagues, Vittorio Fattori, here to my left. Yeah, sorry, I get left and right confused easily. And uh, then Dat Daniela Bataya, also from FAO, who are the first two presenters. After these two presentations, we will have a short break of about 15 minutes, continue with another presentation from a colleague from Singapore, um, some Q&As and closing remarks by our esteemed chair of the CCCF, Sally Hoffer. So that's the program. You have access to it. It's on the website. Um, without further ado, I would then like to pass the word to Vittorio Fattori, who will talk on FAO's food safety foresight program, an overview of emerging issues. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chair. Thank you, Marcus. And good day, everyone. Thanks for coming today to this uh, side event. Um, we do have um, limited time with a packed agenda, so I would like to provide uh, today an overview um, of the emerging issues that uh, at FAO we're looking at uh, on, uh, with the food safety program um, on food safety. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, recognizing how the global agri-food system uh, in which we are all operating is changing and changing very rapidly. Uh, this is due to a number of reasons. I'm listing just some of them, uh, some of which are very familiar to you. And each of them has an impact on, on, on food safety. And we will see briefly how this actually is uh, taking place. Um, so with all these changing, I think it's important that we need uh, to recognize the importance of keeping pace with the changing times. This is a little comics uh, that mm, shows some of the things uh, that it's uh, every day on the, on the news. And in fact, we even had yesterday a very nice plant-based burger. Um, so uh, this is just to tell you how things are, are moving and moving rapidly. Um, so with this evolving scenario, uh, we believe that foresight is important, but what is uh, foresight? So foresight is not looking into the crystal ball and predicting the future. This is uh, something that is not possible and is not the intention anyway. Um, it's, a, it's a structure approach um, in, that helps gathering information and intelligence from different sources, from different experts, different expertise, um, and then leading into um, uh, policy making to think into the medium long term planning um, in terms of what are uh, some of the trends that are emerging and may have some regulatory impacts. Um, there are a number of methodologies that uh, underpins foresight. Horizon scanning is one of those that is probably uh, most frequently used. Um, at FAO, we do have uh, these um, wide network uh, on, uh, upon which we, we pool this, this knowledge. Um, within the house, um, we do have, as you know, being the food chain organization, we can tap into expertise from uh, many different uh, sectors. Uh, um, animal production, for example, my colleague Daniela, and she will talk about that. Um, animal health, um, plant health, fisheries, uh, but even trade, uh, water, and, and, and others. And of course, we do also um, have a big networks outside of the organization with our partners, our members, um, uh, NGOs, the private sector, of course, which is a key player, and then also the experts that work with us on, on, on for example, scientific advice committee. Uh, if you are interested in understanding more about the, the work that we do uh, on Foresight, here is the link also to our Foresight webpage where we store all the information. So very briefly, our process is not complicated, we want to be pragmatic uh, also in light of the, of the resources that we have. Uh, we do get information, as I was explaining, from different sources. We do collect them and we analyze uh, following some criteria that you see them listed. Of course, being ourselves in the food safety division, we want to understand what is the likelihood of the impacts on food safety. Um, and then we based on those criteria, we try to streamline and prioritize issues. There may be issues that for the moment do not 
deserve any active action, um, just need to be monitored. For other issues, probably we do have already substantial information that can lead into, for example, risk assessment or even preparation of technical, technical document or, or reports. And then we communicate. We communicate in the form of, of reports, uh, short videos, materials, technical guidance, and things like that. All of this information, again, it's available on our website. Um, the, some of the, of the trends and, and drivers of change that we are observing are listed here. Uh, if we start, for example, from the top right, um, how technological innovation and scientific advances are impacting on food safety. We understand more um, on, for example, new analytical capabilities that are offering new tools to detect contaminants even at lower, um, uh, are, are lower levels uh, compared to, for example, what was possible even just 10 years ago. Of course, this um, proves some, some benefits, of course, but also some challenges in terms of regulatory frameworks, international trade, and things like that. Urbanization, we are living in cities that are becoming mega cities where food is not only uh, consumed, but it's also produced. And of course, this has some impacts on, on, on food safety. Uh, circular economy, and we will discuss it, um, it's a big concept uh, that has uh, a lot of sense in terms of environmental sustainability. But again, it is important that food safety is part of this consideration to, to, to ensure that we are avoiding any potential food safety implications down the line. Um, new food sources is another big topic, and uh, we will uh, discuss um, today. Uh, and of course, climate change, one of the most defining challenging of, uh, challenges of our time, and again, the impacts that this has on food safety. So all of this has been uh, crystallized in this report uh, that mm, maybe you have seen already. The link is there, where we have tried to, to, to distill uh, the impacts that all of these aspects have on food safety. And we tried also to make the distinction that foresight is quite different from early warning systems that are more geared to um, prevention of outbreaks and outbreaks investigation. Foresight, again, looks a little bit more into medium to long-term issues and not necessarily looking at all, always issue, issues with a negative connotation. We are also looking if some of these issues can bring some opportunities to, to, to food safety. Um, so changing consumer preference and food consumption is of course something that we need all to, to monitor and um, because diets are changing, diets are evolving and of course this can also lead to different exposures and this is important from um, a food safety risk assessment point of view to, uh, to understand what sort of new foods are coming uh, to the plates of consumers and, and, and how diets are evolving over time. And in, in this respect, uh, we have a big uh, work stream on new food sources and production systems. And I'd like to start off by clarifying that when we say new food, we don't necessarily mean something that is completely new. Some of these products that you see on screen, for example, like seaweeds or edible insects, have been consumed in some parts of the world for many years, for centuries even. Um, but what is new is the attention to this growing sector, these growing markets in some parts of the world where they were probably not part of the traditional diets in, in the past. We also have a new production system, like for example, cells-based production food. We have just um, uh, released uh, a big report that looks into food safety hazards of cell-based foods um, that I encourage you to, 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 to look. And again, we look at all food safety aspects, um, microbiological hazards, chemical hazards, also allergens. It's a, it's a big important topic for some of these products that needs to be uh, considered and considered carefully. Um, we will have a technical meeting on new foods uh, in November of this year, um, so stay tuned because there will be more information coming from, from FAO on, on these topics. Um, circular economy, as I was mentioning, uh, it's, a, it's a big concept um, that has a lot of benefits and opportunities. Um, in the report, we have looked at that um, in using plastics as a working example. You all are aware of the impacts that plastics has on the environment and the need to reduce uh, the, um, this impact. Uh, so the need for reusing, recycling plastics to the extent possible. But when it comes to food contact materials and plastics that is used to then come in contact with food, there are some specific consideration that it's important to, uh, to, to, to have. And again, we have um, provided some analysis on what are the key issues that need to be considered in, 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 in these aspects. Um, 
Let's see. If, okay. The other big one uh, area that we are looking at is the evolving science around the microbiomes. Okay. Uh, we understand uh, a lot more uh, on the microbiomes and the interaction that microbiomes has with the environment, with the host, uh, compared to again what we has uh, even just a few years ago. This is triggering some questions in terms of um, regulatory science and risk assessment. Um, do we need to adjust, update our methods? Um, until the science is defined, probably it's not the case, but we want to be sure that we are on top of the science so that when the time is opportune for us eventually to do uh, updates, we know what sort of updates needs to be done. Um, climate change, um, we, you probably have heard that before because we had launched this report that you see on the, to uh, on the bottom left um, uh, a couple of years ago uh, that really provides um, a big analysis of uh, how climate change impacts on very many different food safety hazards uh, from mycotoxin to uh, even hazard in the marine environment with marine toxins, algae blooms, uh, and things like that. And here, these little infographics just the pitches um, one uh, climate change uh, aspect, which is in temperature increase. Uh, and of course, climate change is much more than that. Um, but this is just uh, to illustrate one example and see how this has impact at different levels, from foodborne pathogens in the water uh, to the uptake of, of, of heavy metals in some staple crops uh, to, to marine and, and aquatic environment with algal bloom. So just that to, 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 to provide a snapshot um, um, uh, examples that can also be easily communicated with other stakeholders and, and the public uh, in general to raise awareness of the impacts that climate change has on food safety. Um, as I was mentioning, urban areas are becoming places of food production as well. Um, and we are seeing a lot of new trends uh, in terms of um, new technologies like vertical farming, uh, where um, in, in, in limited spaces uh, food is, is produced. Um, this, of course, uh, has also important aspects to be considered with respect, for example, to the, to the water that is used in these systems, because it's a closed system where water would be reused and recirculating. And again, the importance of making sure that we are not re-entering in the food production potential hazards or residues or things that n don't need to be in, 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 in a final food products. Um, Technological advances are, of course, shaping up our agri-food system landscape in many different ways. Um, some of them we have already touched on. Nanotechnology is not new, but it's still a matter of uh, great uh, attention uh, because, again, we don't understand fully uh, the behavior of some of the nanoparticles, so it's something that we have uh, very well on our radar screen. And of course, blockchain, it, the potentials that it has on, on food traceability, but still the question that it poses in terms of IP, data ownership, and copyrights, and things like that. So just to say, it's a complex uh, scenario, the one on technological advances, but for sure it's a complex scenario where it is important that we look at uh, to understand what sort of implication we need to uh, consider. So, concluding, I was trying to, to be fast so that we can keep some, some, some time for questions and also for, for, for debate. Um, foresight, we believe it's an important uh, tool to identify emerging food safety challenges, but also to, uh, as I was mentioning, also to identifying opportunities and be able to optimize on those opportunities when they exist. Um, it really helps bridging that gap that exists from science to, to, to policy making. And, it provides that tool to um, make sure that policymakers is a little bit more oriented to, to, to be future-proof. Um, so even if we don't have all the answers so to some of these emerging topics, simply because exactly they are emerging, so the, the knowledge uh, and the knowledge database is not complete, still it's important that we start monitoring, we start to provide advice on what actions needs to be, needs to be done. Effective foresight, um, relies on, on partnership. And again, as it is um, a matter of um, uh, broadening a little bit the horizons, it is important that we uh, tap on different type of sectors. We do collaborate and share information with different players on, 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 on the agri-food system. So not just the traditional uh, food safety community, but we go uh, beyond that. Uh, and, and again, there may be issues that at the first glance may be not sounding relevant to food safety, but then 
there may be some some dots that needs to be connected there that there there will be probably some some uh, some food safety consideration that need to need to happen so concluding um Many of the emerging issues uh, that you have uh, seen, and this was a very rapid overview, uh, may have a relevance to the work uh, of Codex. Some of them may be even relevant to, to the Contaminants Committee. So we wanted to have this uh, foresight event uh, to first of all present uh, the work we do and seek if there was any interest, any, any relevance that you can see, and then see if and how this could be followed up uh, in this committee or in others as appropriate. I'll thank you and uh, I'll pass it on to you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have um, a little bit time for clarifying questions. There's a whole Q&A uh, section afterwards, after the three presentations, so we can um, save most of our questions for that segment. But if there are any clarifying questions that anybody would like to pose with regard to Vittorio's presentation, now is your chance. Don't see any raised hands, so that's good. Clear presentation, I take it. Thank you, Vittorio. And uh, then it is my pleasure to introduce Daniela Pataya, another colleague from FAO, who will lead us through the second uh, presentation uh, with the title, um, sorry, I have to find it here. Uh, FAO's work on emerging issues in feed safety in the context of a circular bioeconomy. Daniela, please. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, and again, good morning to everybody, and thanks uh, for being here with us. And I know Marcus is very, very keen in be me being in time, so I will go very straight into the topic, and maybe I will go, I will go quickly among cert certain slides, but I believe that maybe we can circulate, we can make available the presentation so you can have uh, that information there as your further reference. So just uh, very quickly, uh, the, 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 the world is grow, growing, population is growing, the need to have available food is growing. And among that, the, 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 when we look at animal source food, so especially meat and dairy products, we have seen that the growth has been spectacular in the last 30 years, especially for what regards meat and especially poultry meat, and this is expected to, to, to continue growing. So here is some information from your reference. So as you know, most of the, the growth in the animal source food has been met thanks to uh, increased availability of feed and especially compound feed, animal feed. So more and more has been produced, more and more has been available. And the, the greatest ch uh, challenge in this year has been not only to produce enough feed for our animals uh, to produce enough food, but also to make that feed safe enough. What we see also uh, growing and thanks again to Vittorio for his presentation which was a very good background uh, setting the scene for many issues that are also relevant uh, for animal source food and feed production is that the world is growing more and more aware of the need of sustainability especially environmental sustainability uh, the fixed set sector is resource angry especially in terms of water land ground uh, we calculated 30 percent of all crops produ produced in the world are used to feed our animals with uh, a significant uh, use of uh, uh, wa uh, water and, uh, and land and also with a significant contribution to greenhouses uh, gas emission so that's something we have to take into consideration that's something we have uh, to address in our animal production, the animal feed um, production. At the same time, we've also had the big warning on the amount of food that has been lost or wasted. In general terms, we say one third of all produced food is somehow wasted or, uh, or lost. FAO is giving a lot of attention uh, to that. They produce uh, constantly report together with other also organization. And that has led also to this increased um, attention to the circular bioeconomy. Uh, lots on the media, lots of government level research and so on, also trying to not only reduce the wastes, but also reusing and recycle. So that uh, is applicable also to the food system. Circularity in the food system means uh, that uh, the losses of uh, one uh, part of the production can be reused in another production chain, and that, uh, for instance, would be very relevant for feed production. Feed production could therefore contribute to the circularity of bioeconomy by using 
core products, uh, um, byproducts, but also so-called wastes, even if the word is not uh, the, the nicest one to use, uh, and using them efficiently in the food and feed production systems. Many innovative uh, and uh, technologies are there, and that would allow us to make the best use of those uh, uh, new, or maybe, as also Vittorio was saying, not necessarily new, but used maybe in, in a different way, of those uh, uh, feed sources. And again, it's very important that those are available locally to reduce uh, the, the environmental footprint, for instance, due to transport and so on, and we make uh, the maximum use of whatever is available to, to feed our animals, uh, provided it's done in a sustainable and especially safe way, not only for the final uh, food, uh, animal source food, but also for the animals themselves, for their own health and safety. So in this way, we could minimize the use of uh, resources, also the environmental footprint, uh, and contribute to the overall circularity of bioeconomy. A lot of attention has been given to that by the fish sector. Uh, just to give a couple of examples of what uh, the private sector is uh, producing, uh, also some of the uh, risk assessment um, um, authorities are devoting a lot of attention to that, just to look at what can be done, but especially to prevent possible uh, problems racing from that. So having a look at what FAO is also lo doing, looking at these advanced or alternative feed sources. Uh, when we look at the availability of different uh, sources and different technologies, it's really a lot. It's really scary for the amount of work uh, um, can represent and also for the possible hazard that could be introduced in the food chain and the, the risk analysis effort that we need to be done. So this is just to give you an overall uh, idea of uh, the different material that could be entering the, the food chain through the, via the, the animal feed. Again, we have some more traditional agro-industrial co- and byproducts. We have some emerging ones that, again, uh, Vittorio was saying maybe are still traditional in many regions of the world, but are newer or we have, uh, pr we're producing them with new technologies in other parts of the world. And uh, some others are emerging. It's really a West arrived them. I'm not going uh, in detail through all of them, but just to show you the complexity and the variety of these feed sources that, again, are going to end up in the food production chain. Uh, we're looking also at the, the, at the possibility to use food wastes, and there you have a couple of definitions coming from FAO and WHO work, because again, we have realized that the definition are quite different in different parts of the world. And again, a huge amount of material that need to be somehow to be, to be used. We know that it could be converted into animal feed in a safe way, when we use proper risk-based risk uh, measures. And we have examples, we have very valid examples from certain countries of the world, just Japan and uh, South Korea, just to mention a couple, where a large amount of the food waste, 35 to 40%, is used in a way that is uh, perfectly safe, not only for the animals, but also for the, the, the human beings that eventually are going to consume the food those animals are producing. So we have, the technology, we have the information, uh, that's something that could be addressed. Single cell protein, another emerging source of feed material that would deserve attention. And now focusing a little bit ma uh, more on insect, again, Vittorio was mentioned that, that's something we are looking particularly closely uh, because uh, it has been uh, uh, predicted that, that that's used, especially as uh, animal feed and pet food will increase uh, significantly in the coming years. Uh, they have a lot of advantages, uh, not only from the nutritional point of view, it's a protein-rich uh, ingredient for animal feed, and that could be a good alternative uh, to soy or to fish meal uh, production, I mean, uh, ingredients, which as you know, they would have uh, an important environmental uh, uh, impact, a negative environmental impact uh, attached to that. So very good for the animals, very um, good quality of protein for the animals. They have a lot of nutritional um, benefit, even from the animal welfare point of view, but some of them have antimicrobial uh, substances that could be used to decrease the need to use antimicrobials in animal production. So a lot of potential there. 
but there are issues that need to be addressed, not only the, 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 the economy of scale, biosafety issues, the current high cost, but that's something that we need to, to look at because it could uh, significantly decrease if you use different production systems in different parts of the world. So uh, it deserves quite a lot of attention. Uh, so FAO is already giving enough attention to that through publication, uh, again, as Vittorio was mentioning, but also uh, through different uh, multimedia and video and so on, also to raise awareness among the larger, the wider um, citizen side on the importance and the benefit of the use of insect. Uh, but just to go a little bit more deeper on the use of insect as animal feed and especially their safety issues and safety concern, we have had an expert meeting in last November in Belgium, we are now continuing with a wider uh, stakeholder consultation and that's been meeting in the course of this year and we are going to collect the data and information to publish a report on the use of insect and especially all the different implications from the animal, uh, human health point of view, but also the environmental uh, sustainability concern and so on. So please keep you tuned if you're interested and if you have uh, information to provide. When we look at all these different uh, potential sources uh, and the potential solution to our sustainability problems, uh, we should not forget uh, the lessons from the past and all the safety crisis that originated, food safety crisis that originated in animal production due to wrong waste processing practices. So there are just uh, some of them to remind you, some of you uh, are old enough like me to remember the, the disruption they, they cause in the food production chain. And uh, just uh, to show what are the considerations we have to, to take in mind, we have to take into account that we have currently knowledge and technologies to be able to convert all these different feed sources into animal feed and eventually food in a very safe and environmental sustainable way. But it's very critical that safety is always in our mind and especially because, as you saw, the diversity of uh, material is so large that it's really quite a bit of, a, of, a, of an effort. And uh, keeping in mind uh, to stick to the One Health approach that recently has really brought us together from the human, animal, plant, environmental point of view to ensure that uh, the, the, what we are producing meet all the different challenges. What is specific? Uh, on uh, uh, to keep in mind what are the spe specific hazard when we uh, look into account these new advanced alternative feed sources. The usual suspect, the heavy metal, the residues of pesticide, the veterinary drugs and so on, the mycotoxin, but also some newcomers, especially the, the physical hazard that they maybe we have uh, not given uh, um, a lot of attention with a more traditional feed and food, but a lot of uh, packaging material residues, especially when uh, we look at um, former food uh, products or food waste that could re-enter the, the food chain through feed or, or through insect, for instance, or something to take into account. And also what is associated with them, for instance, that the ink product through the packaging that could re-enter the chain. Uh, so these are somehow or, or new issues to, to take into account. Um, the need for maybe new way to do risk assessment is there any need for international standard? Is there any need for um, national legislation that would allow the use of these products still ensuring their safety? Uh, authorization, controls, especially when we look at risk assessment, what are the new challenges? Uh, what needs to be uh, taken into account for this uh, new of feed material, feed ingredients? And when we look, for instance, at the hazard identi identification, we have to take into account the different product types, the starting material, the variety, the processing steps, the new technologies that, uh, that, are, uh, that are being used, all the, 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 the increasing steps in the handling, uh, uh, storage and, uh, and transport, the in reintroducing of uh, what is being reintroduced through the, the waste collection process and so on. So these are all issues that make the process more complex, but somehow they have to be taken into account. What do we see in the future? There is a strong call, for instance, of uh, halving the quantity of food waste by 2030. 
and most of, or, or a lot of this food waste could re-enter the, the food chain through feed production. We have uh, the, the, the issues that uh, also Vittorio was mentioning, the increase of climate change and the impact on food and the feed production. Food insecurity is also an increase in many areas of the world. So that would push also for many resources to be diversified, not using food that could be directly uh, consumed by human beings, but using other resources as uh, feed sources. The resource cons uh, constraints, the uh, higher energy and transport and processing costs. So we all push to look at the different alternative feed sources. Also changes in society. Uh, society can become more open to, 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 do certain, uh, the, to the use of certain material. And, but we need also integrated and harmonized approaches. Knowledge gap, with what we don't know enough, it's, uh, we don't know enough, we don't have inventories of all these uh, feed sources. We don't have inventories of the hazard associated to these sources. And that may be something that will deserve specific, specific attention by FAO and possibly also um, WHO. Uh, the, the monitoring of uh, this hazard in the, in the feed the, in investigating the occurrence. So all these are uh, issues to be taken into account investigating further. But what is forthcoming from FAO uh, side that could be interesting for, uh, for addressing uh, some of these issues, is issues? I mentioned already the expert meeting on the use of insect as feed. We're also having another uh, expert meeting which is planned for beginning of July in Rome on using of alternative advanced feed practices to promote the responsible use of antimicrobials. So we want something specific there, but we will also indirectly affect food safety by decreasing the use of antimicrobials, which are uh, used in animal production and therefore which would end up in our food. We are also having a high level global feed forum planned for the mid of November in Italy. Uh, it's not going to address only safety, but also safety will have a very big role to play there. Uh, and then, uh, as again, as Vittorio was mentioning, uh, sorry, Vittorio, I mentioned you so often, but I think it's, uh, it's very relevant what you said. Partnership is at the basis of, uh, of our activities. Collaboration, sharing of information, knowledge, working together. For this reason, reason it's uh, 15 years we have been doing every year international fee regulators meeting uh, to get together the regulators, the competent uh, national authorities, and the industry, the feed industry, together with FAO, to exchange information and to possibly work together. So last year, uh, last meeting was in January of uh, this year. Next meeting is uh, uh, planned for beginning of next year in Atlanta, USA. We're also planning to have a very specific meeting to focus on issues which are more relevant for Asian countries, again, to take place possibly in April of 2024. If you're interested to participate, if you're interested to share with us also information, please keep tuned. We have newsletters, we have mailing lists through which we inform about all our activities, public new publication, new events, and so on. Get in touch with me and I will send you that information. Just to, to give you one last slide, all those information we have shared are available online, so you can access through this list, for instance. Now, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I am not running out of time, and we need your inputs. So keep your idea for the discussion. We just give some highlights, but we need you to contribute with us and to give us how we can serve your needs better. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much to uh, Daniela as well. Um, so we have some time for clarifying questions. We are actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so oh, kudos to both speakers. Respect. <coughs> and uh, that's wonderful. If there are none, um, I would uh, suggest that we anticipate the break by 10 minutes. We go in a 15-minute break now, um, which means we are back at 11.20. Uh, so I have a coffee come back re-energized for the last presentation stand from our colleagues from Singapore and uh, the panel discussions afterwards. Thank you very much. See you in 11.20. Thank you, everybody, for coming back. Um, uh, 
So it's great to see that we didn't lose that many people. It's always good after a break if most come back. Wonderful news for us. Um, thank you for listening to us. And uh, so the third presentation in, in this is actually from a FAO and WHO member state. So we wanted to have some country experience. And we're very happy to have Hao Ji Ang from Singapore Food Agency here with us to my right. Um, he will be sharing Singapore's experience on new foods and food production systems. That, Hao Ji, please. So good morning, everyone. My name is Hao Chi. So I'm a scientist from the National Center for Food Science in the Singapore Food Agency. So in this presentation, I'll be sharing several examples of Singapore's experience around new food sources and food production systems, or NFPS for short. Right. So for some introduction, um, the Singapore Food Agency, or SFA, was formed in 2019. So the formation brought together um, multiple aspects of food-related uh, food resources and capabilities for the holistic management of the food industry from farm to fork. As for National Center for Food Science, um, we act as the scientific arm of SFA and we support its food safety functions by providing uh, several core functions and they can be summarized in the areas outlined here. They range from uh, food safety lab testing, conducting uh, research and development, as well as conducting risk, risk assessment and communications activities for uh, various foodborne hazards. To set the context for the presentation, in the recent FAO report, as described earlier by Vittorio, so it was described that new food sources and food production systems is one of the major drivers relevant for <coughs> agri-food systems and food safety. So in the document, it was outlined that the word new refers to newly discovered uh, techniques and materials, as well as to food that has been historically consumed in specific regions of the world but has recently materialized in the global retail space. So these several examples here are outlined in the previous presentations as well. Uh, and on a side note, uh, related to this publication, SFA is currently working on a review article on the topic, and we hope that it will be published by the end of the year. So in the context of new food sources and production systems, there are several prominent examples uh, of new food sources in Singapore. Uh, for new foods, they may or may not be considered as novel foods. Um, for example, in the case of cultured meat on the left, they would be considered as novel foods. But for example, certain insect species, um, especially those with a history of safe use, they will be considered, um, while well, they may be considered new in Singapore, but they would not be considered as a novel food. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are also new food production systems explored in Singapore, for example, the one shown on the right, such as those used in urban agriculture. Uh, in the subsequent sections, I'll be going through Singapore's approach and experiences for the use of these three types of uh, NFPSs. So as described earlier, new foods may or may not be considered to be novel within Singapore's context. Um, this is because for Singapore, uh, novel foods refers to food and food ingredients that do not have a history of safe use, and we take the history to be a period of 20 years. Um, we have also included um, foods that are chemically identical to those are uh, similar to those that have naturally occurring substances, but are produced through um, advances in technology, such as precision fermentation through uh, genetically mi uh, modified microbes. So there are several examples shown in the bottom um, of what we would consider as novel, and they are shown in the table below. So this is an overview of Singapore's regulatory framework for novel foods. So the aim of this uh, regulatory framework is to create a system to identify potential risks and ensure that these risks are appropriately managed. So in the following slides, I'll briefly go through each of these components in greater detail. So firstly, uh, SFA uh, requires novel food companies to submit safety assessment for the novel foods for our review. So we recognize that uh, novel food companies may be pushing boundaries using technologies that are nascent and previously unheard of in food production. So because of this, SFA takes an early engagement approach by being open to pre-submission uh, consultations with companies for companies to better understand our requirements. Uh, perhaps more importantly, uh, we have also published a guidance document for companies to be aware of the data required to support their safety assessments. 
Uh, generally, this includes uh, information on, like, say, the identity and characterization of the novel foods, uh, the, the input materials used, what's the manufacturing process, um, what's the purity, allergenicity, or any sort of toxicological data that uh, companies can provide. So using a safety assessment of cultured meat as an example, SFA currently requires company to provide information that covers uh, the inputs, the production process, as well as the final product. So the information would include uh, information such as um, cell lines, uh, what the culture media used, what the reagents used, and we will review the inputs to see whether there are any toxic substances or if they could carry any harmful microorganisms. Um, next, when it comes to the production process and controls, uh, we will review it to ensure that there are no introduction of any chemical or microbiological contaminants, and companies should show that uh, production process is properly controlled and that they adhere to good safety and hygiene practices. So lastly, companies should also show that the final product meets the standards in our regulations, and this includes uh, not exceeding regulatory limits for additives, uh, heavy metals, among many others. So after companies have submitted the safety assessment, SFA will review to ascertain that the food safety issues have been addressed. Uh, this includes checking uh, the possible food safety uh, hazards have been identified, whether the information provided is supported by scientific literature, as well as assessing whether the proposed risk mitigation measures are effective. So as mentioned earlier, uh, novel foods may be produced using new and nascent technologies. Um, and so to ensure that the safety assessment is rigorously uh, assessed, SFA has also established a novel food safety expert working group to provide scientific advice. So upon approval, uh, the novel food essentially becomes, uh, is regulated sim very similarly to um, non-novel foods. So for example, in this slide, we show that uh, the food would need to be, uh, comply with the food regulations. And if they were to be produced in Singapore, they would need to comply with licensing regulations. And in the case where risk communications is needed to bridge the information gap uh, with the public, um, we'll find um, methods of communicating through different channels, for example, releasing uh, YouTube videos or, or uh, through social media platforms. To end of this uh, section on novel foods, I would just like to highlight this publication again, a uh, recent publication by FAO on the food safety aspect of cell-based food. So it covers multiple aspects as outlined here, for example, the principles of uh, cell-based food production, the global landscape regulatory framework. Um, the specific section I would like to highlight is that there's a section on country case studies uh, where Singapore contributed a section on uh, Singapore's approach for cultured meat. So if you're interested in the topic, you can refer to the publication for more information. Onto the second item, um, this is on uh, Singapore's regulation uh, approach for insects. So, as mentioned in the previous section, foods that do not have a history of safe use, they would require a pre market safety assessment. So, this would apply for insect species with uh, no history of safe use. For those that we have determined to have a history of safe use, um, they would still require risk ma uh, management measures to ensure the food safety, just like ma any other foods. So we are currently working out the import and licensing conditions um, related to this uh, farming and processing of insects, and it's currently in progress, and we are working closely with industry as well as experts. So the approach outlined in this slide, of course, will be periodically reviewed um, based on new scientific developments. So we have distilled the key risk management objective into these four points. So, for example, to ensure that the insect is safe for consumption and does not uh, inherently contain any toxic substances and um, the following points as well. So, for each of these objectives, uh, SFA has listed a key requirements for companies to address the safety objectives. And this slide essentially highlights the areas that industry could work on to ensure food safety when it comes to insect production. So following our recent public consultation, SFA has also published uh, relevant details for import requirements and additional licensing requirements. Uh, essentially, SFA will inspect and obtain samples from the import consignments and inspect uh, local farms regularly to ensure that the, the insect is safe for, food, uh, for human consumption. Uh, for example, we'll be looking at things like microbiological pathogens and uh, chemical contaminants. So in this public consultation, we have included, um, we have received views from uh, industry, academia, and the public. And generally, when speaking, when it comes from comments from the ac uh, academia and industry, they're generally supportive. 
of the drug uh, regulatory changes, and they have provided several risk uh, uh, comments that re allowed us to refine our risk management approach. Um, when it comes to the public, however, um, we did receive uh, many negative comments from the public that rejected the idea of uh, insects as foods. So these typically um, come from concerns with uh, food safety and um, a sense of disgust when it comes to consuming novel um, insects. So this highlights there's a need for uh, public risk communications. And of course, there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to consumer acceptance. And so, um, as we always say, food safety is a joint responsibility and consumers have a part to play. And so we, uh, we released uh, a short article uh, called Risk at a Glance. And in this article, we highlight to the public uh, what is SFA's uh, approach towards uh, insect regulations, what are our risk man management measures, as well as uh, several food safety tips that uh, uh, consumers can use to ensure that um, the, the food is safe. Um, as for the last section on new food production systems, I'm sure this audience is very well aware of the benefits of urban farming. And so this method of food production is particularly attractive for Singapore due to its uh, limited land mass that can be uh, allocated for food production. So here are some examples of the type of urban farming systems explored in Singapore. Uh, and specifically, I would like to highlight the LED-assisted vertical indoor hydroponic farms, uh, in which I would like to highlight a case study that, uh, based on the pilot study we have uh, conducted. So in this facility, what we have discovered is that the produce from this facility resulted in uh, relatively high levels of mercury, ranging from 5 to 10 ppm, which is much higher than our established limits of 0.05. Um, examination of the inputs, such as seeds, the nutrient uh, solutions, the growth matrix, uh, showed that they are uh, very unlikely sources. They are not likely to be a sources of the mercury contamination. Um, however, eventually, when we eventually narrowed down the, the mercury contamination, it is likely to come from the LED, LED lights. And upon closer examination, it is likely to be from the polymeric encapsulant of the LED, uh, which contain very high levels of mercury which is about 500 parts per million. So the encapsulant was in the identified to be polyurethane, and we hypothesized that um, the, levels of, uh, the high levels of mercury uh, was from the catalyst and the manufacturer of polyurethane. And the mercury in, in those components eventually accumulated in the samples, resulting in the high levels of mercury in the final product. So as for concluding remarks, um, we believe that NFPS can uh, provide additional food options to consumers. But uh, unlike conventional food, they might come with their own unique risks, which will require, oh, yeah, sorry, uh, which will require unique risk, uh, risk management measures to ensure food safety. So, um, of course, um, when and when um, using a new technology, there should be uh, in place a suitable monitoring system to track the changes in the inputs when adopting these new technologies. And. A strong regulatory network for information technical sharing on the safety of NFPS, in our opinion, would be critical for developing uh, uh, relevant approaches uh, for identification of new hazards and risks in NFPS. So lastly, risk communications are important to ensure that consumers have access to accurate information as well as to help improve consumer acceptance. So that comes to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Archie. Um, so now you have uh, three different viewpoints in the presentation, and some of the overviews were very dense, I admit that. Uh, in particular, the uh, uh, presentation from Archie, I, I'm always very intrigued by the methyl mercury from LED light uh, example, which is a very, you know, one of the things that we are trying to explore with our foresight program is with these unexpected sources of contamination that may affect the food source. Um, that can come from all kinds of drivers. That is a very nice driver on, a very nice example on how production methods may drive um, issues in the final food. We have had other examples how climate change may drive um, the occurrence of certain contaminants, and you may remember that from the FA and WHO side, we presented work on sequatera toxins, um, on, on others that, that is driven, the occurrence of which is, is changing as the climate changes, and so we all need to learn from each other and how to manage these contaminants. 
Anyway, um, with that said, that concludes our three presentations. And it is my distinct pleasure now to hand over to Astrid Bilder from the uh, host secretariat, who will moderate the Q&A section. So Astrid, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And also thank you for, uh, and to you and your chairs for keeping it all very well into the time. So we have plenty of time to, uh, to discuss among ourselves on how to deal with these emerging <coughs> issues. Uh, as Marcus indicated, we have now had three presentations on what is coming towards us and also experience from Singapore, how they, de how they deal with these issues and what their experiences are with this. Uh, and also, um, uh, it was indicated that engaging with the countries on these issues are also very, uh, is very important. So here we are, engaging with you. Uh, on these topics and we would really like to hear from you what are your experiences in this, what are your questions in this, what are your topics uh, to deal with this, but also to see how can we deal in codex with these topics. Do we need extra work or do we have the mechanisms to deal with these emerging issues? Uh, so in, in very short, are we prepared? So um, to ask you first, from the floor, are there any general questions, issues you'd like to share with the speakers and to the panel members on this? Thank you. And I see already Franz raising his hands. You. Oh, and again, thank you. Thank you. Well, in relation to the emerging risks and indeed it's in looking into possible activities related to the emerging risks we have of course to have a, a risk assessment and of course we have seen all these new foods uh, for which indeed the consumption is increasing and of course one of a major part in a uh, risk assessment is to assess the exposure from consumers to certain risks um, and of course we can see of course we have to gather uh, data on occurrence on these new foods of let's say of contaminants but also when looking at indeed the, the food consumption. And it, my impression is indeed, well, we have indeed the food consumption surveys done and so on, but indeed that, it is, that there is a significant delay in really having this fully implemented in indeed the uh, final uh, food consumption surveys that are used for risk assessment. And my question is on if indeed uh, the, the JECFA Secretariat has specific ideas on how to capture these quickly evolving uh, consumption trends in risk assessments, um, f which indeed where we then can take into account the, the move to plant-based diets, uh, the indeed increased consumption of insects, etc., etc. Thank you. Check for Secretariat, who can I give the word? Th thanks, uh, um, Franz, uh, for, for, for the question. And look, especially as you mentioned that this is an evolving uh, space where we probably don't have yet uh, all the, uh, the information that we, that we need to provide a complete and fully fledged risk assessment. However, it's still important that we provide some, some indication, some guidance as to what we know now. And the first step would be to understand whether these new food sources, first of all, present any new hazards compared to conventional food, for example, that we would like to start with that. Um, what we have seen that most of the time the hazards are probably very similar to what we have seen in, in other conventional foods. One aspect that, and I mentioned that in my presentation, that probably deserves some careful attention with some of these products is the allergens, um, allergen poten potentials in, in some of these products, particularly because um, some of these new proteins um, may trigger um, allergenicity response in consumers. They are probably not even aware they are exposed to this type of, of, of allergen. So this is an aspect that surely deserves some, 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 some further attention. And then when we get um, into, a, a, have, we have a full understanding of the, the, the hazards that are to be uh, addressed specifically, then we can also go to the next step of 
putting some resources into compiling even information in terms of um, data uh, on occurrence, exposure, and things like that. But I think we need to start providing some guidance to what we know now uh, and understanding that, again, we may not be able to complete uh, the picture. But again, I think it's important that we show that uh, these is are topics that are being uh, already addressed to, to what we know now. And I, looking at my colleagues, if they want to add anything, Uh, j just to add maybe a, a different version of the same thought, I would hope that uh, the collective risk management present in CCCF and in Codex Alimentarius would help at prevent any significant risk to the consumer. So ideally, if there are enough data and if consumption is high enough, the CHECFA can do a full-blown risk assessment with all the demonstrated consumption data, which is post-factum. It always had the data only available available if the material is in the market. Hopefully, we come out with a conclusion. Checkfa comes out with a conclusion that there is no risk to public health. That guidance would need to come from risk managers to help shape the food systems transformation. If you want to have a big word for that, the integration of new food, new food sources, in a manner that at the end, once it's integrated. We are not sitting there and saying, oops, now we have to redo everything because there's a problem. That we are sitting there and saying, okay, it has been safely integrated. There is no risk for public health. No major trade disruption have happened. Good job. And uh, that requires some talking. I think that requires a lot of negotiation. That requires some courage because we will have to do that in the absence of sufficient data to have full-blown risk assessment and clear-cut uh, basis of, of yeah, scientific evidence. That's the challenge, I think, that's uh, in front of all of us with uh, all these uh, events that are coming out of foresight and, and new production methods, new food production methods, new food sources. We will have to assess them as we go in the best way to when they fully matured, that they do not prevent, that we then don't discover that they present a public health risk. Thank you. Thank you, Fidel. I just want to check if WHO has anything to add. No? Okay, thank you. Does that clarify your uh, question? It clarifies, and I understand the, the challenges, but of course, um, but that is of course a, a bit out of the box maybe, uh, but is it not an indeed an, um, a possibility that in case we are looking into these new food sources and that you could say, well, based upon the current consumption data we have, there is no public health issue as, as regards or no risk for public health as a conclusion, but that then as regards, well, we have seen the, what we call the foresight, indeed, if you expect that you uh, have indeed increased consumption, that you could indeed also, uh, I know it is then not based really on science, so that is already going a bit on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 water, on wet uh, eyes, uh, so to, to say, okay, but in the case consumption would increase, uh, that could ra raise some possible concerns, so already a bit also within the risk assessment, already including a bit of the foresight of how consumption patterns might evolve in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for uh, adding to that. And then I go to Canada. So thank you uh, very much for three very interesting presentations. Um, I, I think you've touched on some of what I was already going to ask, but I, I think I would target this more at uh, Singapore. You, you had mentioned in your presentation uh, specifically uh, cell-based meats, and you also mentioned that, that you were doing some uh, microbiological as well as chemical contamination screens. Uh, I a little bit curious to know how cell-based meats compare to regular meats in terms of just regular safety signals. Uh, uh, have you uncovered any any anything that's kind of standing out that may potentially be unique to cell-based meats? That, that Right, thank you very much for the question. 
Um, as for the microbiological aspects, um, what we have currently observed is that um, relative to, let's say, uh, conventionally farmed meats, they are generally lower in uh, pathogen or microbiological counts. Um, but as for the, the new types of um, hazards that we are currently considering, um, one that stands out to me that is unique for cell-based meat would be the problem of, let's say, genetic drift of uh, the, the cells uh, as compared to uh, the livestock. So currently, the cells are being uh, taken out of the organism and they're grown in a bioreactor for multiple, multiple cycles. Um, that is not the case for uh, traditional livestock. And one thing that we're concerned about is, for example, there might be upregulation or downregulation of certain proteins that results in a change in the food safety profile relative to the conventional meats. Um, so this is a problem that we are currently speculating might happen, but honestly, we do not have any evidence that this will, in, in fact, result in an eventual uh, food safety risk. Um, right now, we are taking a relatively um, conservative approach, I would say. Uh, so currently, we are um, trying to control this by requiring companies to provide uh, data on the expression changes uh, uh, upon multiple cell doublings. So um, that's, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. I see you nodding. That answers your question. It does, and I, I while uh, while I'm asking, I, I guess one other thing that I was curious about was the the notion of the uh, mercury from the uh, light bulbs getting. What what is the mechanism of it getting into the food? Is it their breakage or or like? So right now, I would say we don't really have a mechanistic study on how the uh, how the mercury actually migrates to the final product. Um, at this point, our speculation is that basically the heat from the LDD is basically vaporizing certain amounts of the mercury that eventually accumulates within the cell. But um, while we don't really have the, the scientific studies to really support that hypothesis at this point, but um, that is currently our working hypothesis. Yes, please. Thank you. And uh, just uh, to add, in case it, it was lost, it was mentioned on a few slides from uh, the other speakers. FAO and WHO have just released a whole report on food safety aspects for cell-based meat production, um, where we had held uh, expert workshops, and together with Singapore and SFA actually in Singapore, um, to explore what are the possibly known food safety problems that could occur from cell-based meat production. Um, so we collected, uh, uh, convened a number of experts, including indus industry that, that actually operates that, and uh, have written up, I think, 200 pages on uh, what is conceivable and, and how would that differ, if at all, from um, other possible food safety risks. Um, that, that are already known and can be managed. But then again, it's a different environment, so just because we know it doesn't mean it will get managed, but it can get managed. That's the good news if, if there are no brand new risks, which we have not really identified at that point. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification and uh, information. Are there any other questions from the floor to our panel members? Yes, please. Could you state your name and country? Hi, so for those who don't know me, I'm Jun Ching Er from Singapore. So actually I have a point to add on to what Franz was uh, mentioning just now. So in Singapore, we were actually exploring the idea of you know, having projected consumption data in the future. So I mean, through understanding like uh, consumer perceptions, uh, certain horizon scanning trends, and things like that. So, so this is actually just an idea that we're exploring. And so with this projected consumption data, uh, we could actually you know, combine it with uh, uh, existing total study data or, or contamination data, and then have a kind of a projected exposures in uh, line with uh, changing consumption patterns. So, so it's actually still an idea that we're exploring. So, and, and we j uh, just bring it up for discussion. I don't know if, if this is gonna be an idea that Jack Pa is also exploring through the Foresight Program, or, or yeah, just something for a discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Singapore. And that, I think that also relates to the question, I think, to, to from France about the changing consumption patterns. 
uh, with this emerging risk and new food sources. Uh, so maybe, Jekva, the question was to you if you could address, uh, address this, how you can deal with this, and if the idea from Singapore is something you could also take up or respond to. Thanks, and, and, and I think exactly the, 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 the idea also from Singapore is to see in this interim phase where, again, again, we don't have the full complete picture of the situation, what type of tools, what kind of approach uh, we can use to provide advice. And it doesn't have to be necessarily JECFA, it can be some other ways, because JECFA, as you know, it's a very formal uh, um, a process, mm, we can still do a formal process, but again, giving us the latitude that we need to address these type of issues where we don't have the full picture of the situation. And then what you are saying, using, for example, uh, projected, expected uh, data consumption partners, I think could be, could be absolutely one way. Uh, again, we would need to start first understanding what type of hazards we are to, 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 to address, and then what kind of consumption scenarios are we dealing with. But exactly, it's, this is the idea of not just wait and see and hoping that everything was, will, will go well. Um, we just need to be proactive and think a little bit outside of the box and including using some techniques like you just mentioned. Thanks. Thank you, Vittorio, for adding to that. Uh, Belgium, please. Thank you. Uh, um, so, I'm from Belgium, and I would like to ask uh, what uh, do you use as safety criteria for uh, growth media, like for cell cultures, or also uh, uh, growth media are used for fermentation technology, it could be production of vitamins or whatever, and um, I guess, I don't know, but if, if you're using producing cell cultures, you would not consider the growth media as feed, but, well, do you have any regulation or, or criteria to consider when it is safe? Thank you. So, right now, uh, when it comes to cell-based meat, it is a very new technology, so that's why we are taking the approach of uh, early engagement. Um, as for the criteria, as of now, we do not have any sort of uh, prescriptive limits or anything along those lines. Uh, we are going with the approach of uh, requiring, um, let's say, a certificate of analysis when it comes to uh, demonstrating the safety of the inputs. And as for specific components that the company might add in, um, those comes on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, provided that uh, the specific component itself has um, say, some sort of uh, toxicological studies behind it where it can be demonstrated that the food, is, uh, that that component is safe, we will likely have no objections with the use of that specific component. Uh, in the case where, let's say, the component has no history at all, um, it is very likely then we will require companies to provide a toxicological studies to support the safety of those components. Thank you for that. Does that clarify, uh, Christine? Oh. Yeah, it feels like there are a lot of open questions because compared to food or feed, it feels like there's nothing. Oh, but, but maybe I've simply not read it, but yeah, I don't see what criteria to apply to growth media. Thank you. Yeah, so we are definitely very sympathetic to this uh, in the sense that um, because this is new, it is very difficult to tie down a criteria at this point. And I think one thing we have to pay attention to is that for these, uh, very many of these new companies, they are trying um, new technologies. And for us, if we impose early criteria as to what is the range of uh, inputs that can be used, essentially we, are, we could be stifling any sort of um, innovations in this, in this space. So that's why we might want to take a, a, a slower approach when it comes to setting a very strict criteria when it comes to um, this sort of inputs in cell media. Yes, and these are then the things we encounter because it's also so new, huh? so it's all at the beginning. I see a hand raised from uh, Steve from Australia. Yes, um, thank you, Astrid. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to also comment on the, the Singapore situation, uh, but that's not to say, I should say, the other two presentations were not excellent. They were, so all three were really good presentations, so thank you very much. 
If I'd like to, I guess, commend Singapore Food Agency as the first in the world to actually approve a cultivated meat product. That was the chicken product. Um, uh, we've been working closely with Singapore and they have done a lot of detailed work in terms of uh, the underpinning risk assessment. Uh, but there are some interesting questions that have arisen, particularly from Christine and so on, and um, also regarding the food consumption data. On the latter, I think the normal approach would be to use a subsequent, where there's an absence of food consumption data for a particular food commodity, to use a substitute that would represent a conservative type food consumption uh, situation. For the cultivated chicken, I, I would suggest that um, you might use consumption data from the conventional chicken, given that the consumption of the cultivated chicken is likely to be lower given the cost. Uh, and there, I'm assuming for many insects there will be food consumption data from some parts of the world that, that could be used as, as a substitute. Uh, I'm fascinated by the mercury example, and I think that does highlight how we have to be attuned to new hazards associated with these new foods and production systems that may be unexpected. And I think in that regard, uh, I'd like to emphasize, I guess from my perspective, the importance of collaboration and information exchange and also exchange of data between national governments and food regulatory agencies. Because I think that, that as we move forward in this space, that's going to be really important so that we can uh, um, in ensure that innovation can continue moving forward, but is, innovation is done in a safe way. So I'm sorry, Astrid, that's not really a question, just some comments. Um, but back to you, thank you. Thank you very much, and maybe FAO can comment on it, Marcus? I can always comment on things, but uh, so I can comment on uh, comments. Uh, no, it, it reminded me of the uh, other discussions that are actually happening at the same time, in particular within the context of cell-based uh, food production, is what is the equivalence question? When is a cell-based product a meat replacement? When is it not a meat replacement? And how should we call it? And if it, meat is not complicated enough, you can think about milk, uh, cell-based milk production, or equivalent of thereof, or maybe with genetic editing or genetic modification of some of those cell lines, the whole discussion gets more interesting. Um, and, and we have to start stop then at some point and, and think about nomenclature or nutritional equivalence or functional equivalence uh, th that, that factors into the discussion also with regard to replacement for, for exposure assessment. Uh, because there's intrinsically some assumptions baked in that uh, the here chicken nugget that, that this has been approved in Singapore would be a replacement for a conventional chicken nugget, which may be a fair assumption here, but it may not hold true in future because of the flexibility that these new food production methods will provide to all manufacturers and to all of us. Um, that then may undermine some of the definitions that we're used to, or we need to very carefully think whether those definitions still hold up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other responses, comments, questions? Yes, U.S. Lauren. Uh, thank you very much, and those are very interesting uh, presentations, so I very much appreciate it. Uh, we heard about a lot of potential problems that we might face in the future. Um, in some of those, we can, I think, draw a clear line to the work of this committee. So, for example, uh, um, Singapore pointed out that there was a mercury, there were mercury levels in various plants that were much higher than a maximum level. Um, but some of the um, situations that were uh, identified as future problems aren't necessarily under this committee's remit. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, if there are physical particles of chunks of things ground up in the recycled animal feed, or, um, um, you know, perhaps uh, even just uh, good practices for, uh, that would fall in the food hygiene area. So I, I'm curious for, uh, you know, input from all the presenters on what they think would be, let's say, 
the one or two key issues that uh, might really align with this committee's uh, with this committee's work. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any presenters who would like to respond? Vittorio? Thanks, Astrid, and thanks, Lauren, for, for, for the question. Uh, you touched exactly on, on, on why we wanted to have this discussion here. And again, it's, um, it's the beginning of a conversation. We are not pretending that we will be solving the issue uh, now and today. We wanted to, uh, to some of these issues, in fact, mm, perhaps all of these issues, don't fit squarely into any codex committee. Um, but we were thinking where we could start uh, a discussion on some of these topics um, and what possibility exists if there is interest in Codex uh, to follow up on some of these issues where we could begin the conversation uh, on, on these topics. And, and again, the circular economy aspects, you saw, for example, there is issue related to, to plastics and food contact materials, which is another big monster. Uh, again, probably we don't need to take it all at once, but maybe we can slice in different pieces and see what could be an area where, if there is interest by members, we could do some work. Um, microplastics, it's a topic that is growing, and again, um, maybe there is room for, for, for considering to do something. FAO and WHO have done work already, potentially there can be done more. Um, insects is another um, aspect, as we said, from food and feed safety aspects. So that, I think there are a variety, and again, it's not a simple yes or no or tick in the box. It's probably we, we need to, 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 to have a little bit of imagination and see how we can address that. I'll take that opportunity, maybe if there is Gracia in the room, to ask um, what sort of possibility exists within the Codex framework to have some of this discussion. And again, I think we need to disconnect for a moment from the, the classical um, outcome of this committee that there may be an ML or a code of practice I think we need to, to see other possibilities because, again, for some of these issues, we will not have right now all the knowledge, all the data that would be required to do uh, um, a standard. Uh, and probably it's not even needed a standard at this point, but it will be already enough good first step to have a discussion on some of these issues at the level of Codex. So I don't know if you, Gracia, would like to provide maybe uh, some overview about what possibility exists within the Codex framework. Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, um, good morning to, to all delegations and, and thank you to, to FAO and WHO um, for this um, side event. Well, uh, the possibility in CODES is always open by having this um, standing item on the agenda of every committee in CODES, including this one, which is other business. There is where every country has an opportunity to bring issues um, um, to the committee, which um, are not scheduled for discussion at this meeting, but that could uh, still um, have some sort of brainstorming and, and then sort of agree to, to have, um, have a, a schedule for the next um, session. If you uh, look at the agenda, at least um, for the contaminants also, um, you will see that under other business, you do have some explanatory notes. If there will be the wish, for instance, of um, this um, committee to bring more visibility to um, these sort of new or um, novel issues in Codex, um, we can still have um, some explanatory notes and the other business where you uh, could uh, encourage um, countries to bring um, some of these novel issues to, to the attention of CCCF and uh, subject to agreement by this committee, uh, we can include it in, in the discussion. Um, another possibility, um, if um, you really would like to look more into these um, foresight uh, matters, could be um, to agree to have an agenda item which is um, with a title which is um, specifically dedicated to, to bring possible issues like this to brainstorm and like um, Vittorio says, doesn't have to be with the intention to have a maximum level of or a code of practice, but simply exploring uh, what could be done. Uh, for instance, by presenting a background document, I, I will not call it discussion paper just to make a difference, I mean, but the issue will be still um, to describe a little bit uh, what could be discussed, what could be, um, if there is any room um, in, in, in this committee to do something, or what could be that something that can be done, and, and just have a discussion on that and, and, and see 
how we can address these issues with the current data and information available. So, I mean, you, you have an standing option, but also you can make it more visible, but, but, but um, having something which is more specific under other business, or just having an item, perhaps for the upcoming session of this committee, because you see value in making it more visible, and by doing that, you encourage um, countries to bring these issues uh, to the attention of the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gracia, for that explanation. So there are several options we can address in CCCF these kind of issues. They can be raised on the other business. We could also add an explanatory you note know, to other business uh, that these emerging issues could be put forward as well uh, to be discussed in CCCF, or otherwise maybe there could be a standing item on the agenda, uh, which would co be called uh, emerging issues or something like that. It's maybe something for you to reflect upon what would be a good mechanism for us to keep these things in mind. So at least these are the opportunities. There are opportunities to have discussions on emerging issues without immediately, you know, going into the ML path or code of practice path to, to have a more broader discussion or signal to other, to other countries. Because as stated, it's also very important to exchange with each other the information. So the CCCF could be used as a, as a forum for that. So having uh, said that, are there any other questions from the room to the panels and the presenters? If not, I would like to switch the roles and ask the panel members if they have questions to the public, to the audience. Do you have any particular questions to ask? And what would you like to hear from, know from the countries uh, present? Yes, we do have a question. Yes, yeah, Daniela, We have a few questions, please. actually, because we, we have run this uh, side event to have input from your side. So I think uh, both the three of us uh, presented a wide range of issues that we have seen emerging and uh, particularly FAO and those in Singapore we're giving attention, but we would like uh, to know what are we missing? What is in your countries, so what, what, what are the emerging issues in terms of not only food and feed products, but also new technologies, new challenges, new trends. What do you see coming up that could present possibly a risk for food safety, but so also something that we need to address within Codex, within FAO and WHO, what are you working at? Which kind of information you have? A little bit to hear from your side, things which are missing our foresighting exercise and, and our scanning, to hear a little bit more from your side. Yes, please, US, Lauren. Uh, thank you, uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to share just from a, a colleague said um, she was very interested in what Codex is doing on um, e e retail uh, foods. So how foods are you know being uh, kind of ordered and just online and distributed online that was presenting quite a few challenges. So I'm not entirely sure that's again in in the in the remit of what we're talking about, but definitely is an issue of, of concern that, that wasn't, uh, wasn't mentioned. So I'll pass that on. Thank you. So there's an issue that we see also as a development or the US sees a development and I think in all countries that e-retail is, is increasing and all the issues are uh, and how do we address that? And I see Verna waving from the back. Verna, please. Thank you, Astrid. And uh, just to maybe inform the group here that in Codex we are doing work on e-commerce, e-retail, and that is being done in the Committee on Food Labeling. But it's more about the information that should be provided to the consumer when you purchase through e-commerce. Thank you. So that's being addressed by food labeling. Yes, in the Committee of Food Labeling. Thank you very much. Canada, please, John. I'm not altogether clear if this is the right place to bring this up, but um, in terms of 
potential contamination from using recycled materials in food packaging. Would that be something that would be dealt with here? That's something we're very interested in, and it's kind of the interface between a lot of the new environmental concerns of, about, you know, uh, by 2030, reducing the, uh, the amount of plastic in landfill. We're seeing a big push towards, uh, uh, by our stakeholders, towards using recycled materials, and we're not sure that we're ready for it, I guess. Thank you for that question. Uh, Vittorio, your response? I think the example brought up by, by Canada, it, it's very relevant, at least resonate very well with also what we are seeing uh, uh, at FAO. And, and you mentioned exactly one of the, of, of the driver for, for, for this, um, the increased need of, of sustainability in, in, our, in our agri food system production, the need to reuse and recycle things. So the circular economy aspect that I was discussing also during my presentation. Uh, we are working into making uh, a report on circular economy and the impacts that it has on food safety. And one of the examples is exactly that, that there are things that get in contact with food that probably don't need to be in contact with food. Uh, and, and so that's, that's one aspect. The water recycling is another one. Um, we will see also the example from, from, from Singapore, again, particularly in close production systems where the water is being reused and recirculated, this may pro, pro some, some, some challenges. So there are different dimensions. The food waste that is used as a substrate for rearing animals and rearing insects, for example, mm -hmm. also can create some challenges. So the circular economy aspect, for sure, it's, we see that it, it's, it's important uh, from a food safety standpoint. Again, if and how this can be taken up at Codex, it's a different discussion, but I think it's a discussion at some point it would be nice to, to start like we are starting today. And again, it's not a closed discussion that, yes, this will lead to an ML, as we said, or a code of practice. For me, it would be already enough to, to start the conversation like that. And, and thanks to Gracia, she has outlined. Also, there are a number of possibilities to have this type of, of, of discussions, even within this committee, which I think could be, could be of interest to, to, to consider at least. Thanks. Yes, thank you. And I believe also part of your question was if is this is the committee where we can deal with such things. Uh, I believe, but I'm looking also at the Codex Secretariat, that this would be an unintentional presence from chemical in food. So it would be in the mandate, but I would like to hear Codex. Gracias, uh, Verne. Um, Referring back to the comments from Canada, definitely yes, there is room for this committee to deal with that. And I don't know whether my colleague wants to add something. Thank you. Thanks. And I think Victoria touched on the issue of the water. For example, in Codex, we, we, are, being, we are going to be sending um, guidelines on, on water reuse uh, to the uh, commission. But that is from a microbiological food safety point of view, and a few years back we did refer that to CCCF, but at the time I suppose we were not ready to really think about the issue, and I think the time is really ripe now for us to think about how do we bring in the issue of contaminants, because that guideline purely addresses microbiological safety, and there are many other issues that we need to consider. So I think probably my chief is here. <laughs> that in Codex we need to think about things in a more holistic way, and I think I would hope our executive committee will pick that up when they look at the, the guidelines on, on, on the water reuse and recycling, you know. And then for us as a committee to start thinking about how can we contribute to that document as well to ensure the safety from a contaminants point of view. That is just one example. Thank you very much. Any additions from our side? No? And Victoria? Just, I, I, yeah. I think the comment from, from Canada triggered this, this mm, round of discussion, which for me, it's, it's very interesting. And, and thanks also, Verna and Gracia. Yes, the, the example of water is another one, I think, where, yeah, the chemical safety aspects, I think, are, are, are important, as important, at least, as, as the microbiological aspect. So I think it will be, again, something for us to, to, to consider. Thank you. Any other uh, delegations who'd like to share their experience or any or things we are missing? Yes, please. Could you stay? Sí, gracias eh, por la oportunidad. Eh, bueno, escuchándoles, 
escuchándoles hablar, eh, he prestado atención punto a punto y realmente los temas emergentes subrayan esta importancia, pues nos aperturan al enfoque de nuevos trabajos que se refieran a, a estas necesidades. Ahora, hace un momento alguien mencionaba el tema de la, de la contaminación de los envases. En el caso de Panamá estamos trabajando dentro de nuestra legislación para ir reduciendo, ir reduciendo el uso del plástico. Eh, he visto este impacto de reducción en el mundo. Eh, la convergencia de varios temas globales sigue siendo preocupación para muchos países, como es el caso de Panamá. Eh, quiero felicitarles y decirles que su trabajo están siendo muy importantes para nuestros estudios nacionales, pero aquí viene mi pregunta. Eh, ¿Tendremos a futuro guías de trabajos puntuales para aplicarlos en nuestros trabajos, en nuestros países, perdón, recomendaciones de tratamiento de estos hallazgos que serán aplicados a, nuestras, a nuestros países? Hablamos de, de un correcto bienestar, de salud pública, inocuidad y, y salud mental. Eh, si sabemos que eh, que comemos seguramente eh, nos seguiremos sintiendo bien. Eh, más que nada la pregunta puntual, ¿vamos a tener guías a futuro para tratar estos, estos temas? Thank you, Panama, for your, for your question. Anybody from the panel to respond? Vittorio? Thanks a lot to Panama for, for, for the nice question. And, and yeah, the, the short answer is, at least from FAO, any guidance, any materials uh, that we uh, produce um, that is relevant to this discussion, we will always uh, bring it to the attention uh, of, of Codex and CCCF in particular. We have an agenda item, agenda item three, where we pro um, provide updates from, from FAO and from WHO, of course, and we will certainly uh, be providing that information. To the specific topics that we are discussing now, we have a number of publications that have already been made available. As I mentioned, we are working on a report on circular economy that hopefully will be um, ready in time for the next session. We are also working on, on a short review on food contact materials that would also be hopefully available for next session. So anything that we produce will be um, put forward to, to the attention of the committee. The issue then is whether based on this initial um, knowledge and, 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 and inputs from, from FAO and from WHO, whether there was any interest then to follow up uh, the discussion at Codex or not, um, that's something that exactly we, we can discuss. Uh, but for sure, if we do provide guidance, and we do, uh, we will certainly make sure that this guidance is available to all Codex members. Thanks. Thank you, Marcus. Maybe just to add to that. So we have two different avenues, if you want to think about it that way. Um, we provide scientific advice as, as a global normative service to, to normative uh, organizations like Codex. And uh, those guidances are by design somewhat high level because they need to apply on a more global setting. Now, Codex can translate this into maximum limits if there's enough interest on a, on a uh, global level. But that does never prevent any country specifically asking for, um, for help from FAO or WHO or both to implement national legislation to adapt uh, any specific issues to the national situation and help implement a country from the legal background on how to set up a food safety law to uh, how to um, run a food control system, to how to assess a food control system, how to improve a food control system. We provide many services that are outside of Codex mandate to countries specifically to help them um, improve their food safety situation and food safety governance in general. So just reach out to us or reach out to the local FAO office if you have any questions or any needs in that regard, and we will gladly discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, WHO, Kim. Thank you very much, Astrid, and good morning, everyone. Just to add to what my colleagues from FAO mentioned, I fully agree from the WHO side. I also want to mention to Panama that we just quite recently 
uh, from the WHO side published uh, a, a, a kind of guidance and a tool to various countries in all six UN languages on how to estimate the burden of foodborne diseases. I will explain this in a bit more details this afternoon when we go to agenda point three, but just to mention that also from the WH side, we do similar activities on our own or in collaboration with FAO on this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. So there's much guidance available and also support available if you want a specific support. Um, we're quite approaching the end of the e meeting, but maybe a short remark, question, Daniela. No, just a remark to, uh, to what my colleagues were saying. What the, the, uh, the FAO support and some uh, WHO, so not only in the, the provision scientific advice and the, the helping countries in uh, uh, translating uh, the, those codex recommendation in. Uh, national legislation, but also we have an overall set of capacity development activities. So going from the legal advice, uh, looking at legislation, but also then the implementation of those codex standards or uh, national legislation and uh, providing very specific concrete guidance to producers, so also to private sector. For instance, what we have done uh, when we developed the, the manual on um, feed safety, based on the codex uh, uh, code on good animal feeding, but then translating in, in good practices that both producers and government officers could apply in their own country. So as Marcus was saying, there is a whole range of activities that really work hand in hand with codex, providing information, but also helping countries in taking on board all that information and the wealth of, uh, of knowledge. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Well, I get the feeling we're far not done with the conversation about emerging issues and how to deal with them. So uh, let's take it up further in the, in the coming meetings and the coming days on how to address these, uh, these issues. Uh, thank you for your lively discussion. Thank you for all your presentations and work. Uh, for all the speakers and thank you all for your questions. So this was a lively discussion. And I will leave the last word uh, as for our chair of the committee, Sally, to close our event for this, uh, this morning. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning to you all. And thank you to the panel. It was great to have this discussion. Um, for you all, we have a cross-country inter uh, interdependence which tie together our agri-food systems globally. And this also ties together our challenges. So we, as a committee, uh, need also to look at our fit for purpose, which is coming our way, because there are a lot of challenges coming our way. Um, and we addressed some of these at the panel. So I think it's nice to l learn from the reach out that WHO, FAO do to all the countries to get aid, uh, but also for us to see whether our agenda is fit for purpose in the future. So this is for us now to look, not now, but well, at least now, but also in years to come. So please take also time to reflect in your own country on these issues and what you would like to learn. For us, it's very good to know that we in the Netherlands are also discussing this in a wide range of areas and we look at sustainability, but we do mix these with the safety issues, but also with the health issues. So we're looking at how can we proceed further with our agriculture system at this minute but also with the products which are being presented to the consumers. But are these safe, healthy, and sustainable? So how do you present these? And we do have a lot of discussion with our farmers, but also with the private sectors. So it is, in every country, a situation sometimes different, but sometimes alike. So let's learn from each other. So with this, Thank you again, panel, for starting up this discussion, and I think we need to have this discussion every year, 
and maybe have some specific points or themes raised so we can do some small uh, in-depth uh, uh, discussions and to, uh, well, inspire each other. Thank you and we'll see each other uh, this afternoon with the opening of the Contaminant Commission. <laughs>